Good afternoon, uh, brothers and sisters, families and friends of David Hales. Uh, my name is Eric <clears throat> Mitchell. I'm a counselor in the Redmond Bishopric. Uh, Bishop Spencer Brown has asked me to uh, conduct this. In celebration, in honor of the life of David Charles Hales, <clears throat> our beloved husband, father, grandfather, brother, uncle, cousin, friend, and neighbors or neighbor, excuse me. David was born April 1st, 1955 in Salina, Utah. He died January 22nd, 2022 in Aztec, New Mexico. His parents, Willis B. and Anna Faye Hampton Hales, both deceased. Married Lillian Hatch, January 18th, 1975, in Redmond, Utah. They were later divorced. Married Sharon K. Stewart, July 2nd, 1983, in Elko, Nevada. The children are Rebecca May and Jared Langford. Michael David Hales and Lexi Peterson. Crystal Ann and Brett McCabe. Uh, McCabe, excuse me, McCabe. I've got tears, I'm having a hard time reading this, so. Uh, Corey Willis and Krista Hales, Lucas Aragon and Tristan Aragon. Grandchildren. Jenna and Tyler Jensen, Joshua Langford, Quinn Fabert, Tate Fabert, Soren Hales, Knox Hales, Ella McCabe, and Ledger Hales. Siblings, Leslie and Ed Christensen, Carrie and Starla Hales, Wayne Hales, Kendall and Brenda Hales, Christine and Alan, deceased laws. The services today, Wednesday, February the 2nd, 2022, 12 noon at the Redmond LDS Ward Chapel. Officiating Eric Mitchell, counselor, Bishop's counselor at the Redmond Ward. The Compassionate Services, LDS, <clears throat> excuse me, Red, Redmond LDS Ward Relief Society Sisters. And services from Springer Turner Funeral Home. The uh, family prayer was presented or given by Kendall Hales. David's brother. Prelude and postlude music will be by Emily Laws Anise. I will be conducting Eric Mitchell. The invocation will be by Leslie Christensen, a sister. Tribute will be by Carrie Hales, a brother. Speaker will be Scott Langley, a friend. A vocal solo. Love Without End, Amen, Dave Peterson. A poem, Life Remembered by Cheryl Christian, uh, uh, Winchester, excuse me. Memories by the children, Becky, Mike, Kaylee, Kaylin, Kaylee, excuse me, and Corey. Then I will make uh, my remarks. The internment will be at the Redmond Cemetery in Redmond, Utah. Uh, the pallbearers are Michael Hales, 
Corey Hales, Jared Lankford, Tate Fabert, Josh Lankford, and Taylor Jensen. Honorary Paw Bears, Soren Hales, Ledger Hales, Lucas Aragon, Knox Hales, and the following individual who are on a, honorary Paul's Bears are from the Sufco Mine Rescue Team. Clayton Dalton, Fred Veter, Fred St. Pierre, Troy Hatch, Brian Stewart, Mabin Crane, and Becky Edwards. With that, we will have uh, Sister Leslie Christensen give us the invocation. Our Father in heaven. <laughs> So we gather here today to honor Dave. We're so grateful for him, for his love, unconditional love, his kindness, his generosity, his friendship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His integrity, his good example. And we pray that we might all think of him and try to emulate those characteristics in our own lives. We're grateful for all that Thou has given us. We're grateful for the plan of salvation and for the gift of thy son Jesus Christ and for his example and his atonement and for the resurrection which and for the knowledge that we can all be reunited again one day a day that we look forward to we ask a special blessing on Sharon, Becky, Michael, Crystal, and Corey and their families. That thou wilt wrap thy arms around them and comfort them as they go forward in this life without, without Dave. We ask also for comfort the, for the rest of us. We're grateful for this beautiful sunny day that we have to lay him to rest. We know he's happy being reunited with loved ones on the other side and probably riding horses. And we're grateful for all we have. And we love thee so much. We say this in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now uh, have a tribute by Kerry Hills, followed by Scott Langley. Vocal solo by Dave Peterson, poem by Cheryl Winchester, and then the memories by the children, and then I will make a few remarks. I really want to thank everybody for being here today, and thank you for, for my family and uh, a lot of you people have traveled to be here. I appreciate that. Thanks for all these be beautiful flowers. My word, it's really awesome. And I got uh, a few notes here I scribbled down in case I lose my track. 
my chain of thought, which I probably will. I'm really honored to be asked to speak today by Sharon and the kids, and asked to take a few minutes. I could really talk all day about him. Really, it's been just you know a shock for us. But I talk a little bit about I guess when we were children because I don't think anyone else will. <laughs> but uh, when he when Dave came in into our life. I mean, he was, he was the most adorable little boy you ever saw. I mean, everybody loved him. He always had <clears throat> this little round face and big smile on his face all the time. And even even up till probably he was a teenager. I mean, every, everybody just dawdled over him. He was, he was just one of those people that really drew people to him. And <clears throat> uh, he, he was something else. I mean, I, I'm sure I was little at one time, but I was never cute, so I didn't have that problem. I'd, I'd get a, I'd get a little jealous. I'd get a little jealous quite often sometimes because of the way the grandparents and aunts and uncles and older cousins would carry on about him. But anyway, he probably from about the time he could crawl, he tried to follow me everywhere I went, and he was a determined little guy. He was we. We not only, of course, grew up together, but we shared a bedroom, shared the same bed probably till we were, uh, you know, I don't know, teenagers maybe. But, uh, yeah, we, uh, we had a good time. We, or of course, our mother kind of was our rock back in, in those days. She was home all the time with us and taught us a lot, taught us the importance of doing chores and doing things together. and. It didn't matter what I did, he would want to be right there with me, and it wasn't to watch either. And I was always pretty big for my age, and he, well, I was big for my age, and he was always, he was a little guy till later on in life. He was one of the smallest kids his age, so. <clears throat> we, Dad used to call us Mutt and Jeff when we were running around together, but we did, we really spent a lot of time together, did everything together, and, uh, in fact, really on my, my first day of kindergarten, that's when the school was here in town. We had elementary school. My class was the last one to finish sixth grade there, but it was right down there by the Legion Hall, right about where the War Memorial is now. And I walked over to kindergarten. I was, I was there maybe an hour, and guess who shows up? Dave, he came, there, he came to go to kindergarten with me, too. And, <laughs> and the teacher, she just, of course, fell in love with him right away and let him stay. <laughs> Called mom. And, and, she come and got him after a while, but he, I don't know what they worked out, but he came to kindergarten with me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they shut him out of first grade, but anyway, he, uh, of course, like I said, mama, mom, she was always there, and dad was working, seemed like, all the time when we were little, and, uh, so, anyway, I think she did a good job with us when we were small, I think she had to you know, our dad, his his father died when he was eight years old, and that was in 1930. So, I think he had had some stories to tell that he never did talk about it. But mom had to teach him, coach him a little bit about how to be a father. And I don't think any of the younger ones, will know, but I think Leslie knows what I'm talking about a little bit. He he was coachable. It turned out real awesome, and it, it didn't take me long to. Anyway, even uh, I guess when I turned about eight years old, that dad, dad decided I was old enough to milk the cow. So he took me out and got me milking the cow. And Dave was mad as heck because he wanted to milk the cow too. So I taught him how he'd come out and he'd milk the cow. And we'd go morning and morning and evening. We'd go out and feed the animals and milk the cow. And we thought it was fun. We never thought it was work. We had a good time doing it. I thought it was pretty cool to go to elementary school with menorah on my cowboy boots, too. So, anyway, but <clears throat> let's give you a little idea of how it was. Uh, when Dave was about seven years old, our younger, him and my younger brother Wayne, who was two and a half younger, years younger, they were about the same size. And people would ask if they were twins. Not, not identical twins, because Wayne wasn't cute either. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we 
growing up in this town was just a wonderful place to be raised. It's, they've done a lot to make the community a lot safer, but they've taken a lot of the adventure, adventure out of us. Out of it, I think our growing up with our cousins and friends, we have we had a lot of relatives here in this town, and I think our playground was about a three mile radius, and we used it all. We, whether it was on horseback or bicycles or walking or whatever, we, we just we had a great time together and a lot of fun and we got, got away with most of it. Now I think everybody knows how Dave loved horses. Well, our cousins, Steve and Charles Lee Robert, they, they taught us really everything there was to know about horses, you know, how to work them, ride them, their pleasure. You know, we, we'd harness them to hook up to wagons and all this stuff and how to take care of them too. And I liked it, but Dave loved it. He just fell in love with the horses. And when he was maybe 11 or 12 years old, they managed to get him some rides on some racehorses. He actually rode racehorses in, the, in some of the races here around the county. And, and that's what he was gonna do. He was gonna be a jockey. He was gonna go win the Kentucky Derby, all this, and then <clears throat> for something Terrible happened when he turned 14. He started to grow and grew about 10 inches in two years. I've never seen anything like it. He just shot up like a bean sprout, you know. Anyway, he he was uh, <clears throat> I don't know our, a little bit more. I guess our our father he was a World War II that and fought in Europe and Africa and. He's part of the battalion. Nick, name, Nick, their nickname, the German given, was the Blue Devils because they're ferocity. So he he expected us to to contribute to society and not be a drain on society or a drone, what he was called. Don't be a drone. So we've tried. I don't think any of us are drones, but Dave was amazing with all the things <coughs> that he was involved in and all the things he did to help the community and stuff wherever he's lived. Uh, and he, you know, Dad, of course, he wasn't very <coughs> sympathetic. If you had a feelings hurt or something, but he'd tell you where to find sympathy. And if any of you want to know, I'll let you know. I'll share that with you. But, <laughs> other things like uh, don't tell people your problems because half of them don't care and the other half are glad you got them. So. <laughs> keep it to yourself. And I think, think Dave, Dave was that way a lot because I, I know he had some things bothering him at times that he didn't want to talk talk about him. I mean, he, Dave's just one of those guys. He, he, he lived for Sharon and his, and his children, you know, he lived to his, his grandchildren. My gosh, whenever he talked, Talk about his children. He he'd be so full of pride. And then when he talk any about any of the grandchildren, he'd he'd glow from head to toe. That's so that's what he was all about. He had a tremendous amount of integrity and principles. And you couldn't in both his personal life and and his professional life. There's no no way he was wavering. No matter you could threaten him, bribe him, whatever whatever he was. He was rock. He was just a rock solid guy, and you know we we kind of. I went to work at Sufco first, and he come, he come up there. Not I can't remember. Not a long not a long time after. Not probably less than a year later, and we were able to work together there. And then in uh, 1977, when the new Mine Act came out, we. We're part of the first mine rescue team for a while, for a while till I left. I left Sufco and went to another place. And we, I don't know, we were together in the line of Junior Chamber of Commerce. Like when I left here in 1980, all, about all the officers were kids that had been raised here in Redmond. And got our EMT certificate together, which we, we got the, we took the class and we passed it all out, the two of us. and. He continued on with that for years and on the ambulance and stuff, and I didn't. I wasn't, I guess I wasn't dedicated enough, enough or whatever, but then in uh, 2000, 
2000, I got, I was blessed to be able to get a job with him and some other really terrific guys down in, in Farmington, New Mexico to put in a new coal mine and uh, we created our own vision statement and worked together. It was a, been an unbelievable blessing. In fact, it's been hard, hard to give up on it. He was, we were both planning on retiring this, this spring, but I don't know how that didn't work. It was just, this all happened so fast. It just was a really hard on Anyway, uh, I'm really proud to call him and my brother, and uh, I'm blessed for the time that I've had to spend with him so far on earth, and I know it's not the end. I'll see him again, and I'm so grateful for that knowledge. I'm grateful for the atonement of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that makes, that makes it possible for all of us to return to the presence of Heavenly Father through repentance and, and I just uh, pray that we'll all, our hearts will be filled with love and forgiveness for one another and I'll just share these few thoughts in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, and uh, my name's Scott Langley, and actually my things pick up a lot about where Carrie's ended off in 2000 uh, when we first met. I'm a friend, coworker. he was a mentor to me. Um, so it's an honor to speak. Uh, you know, Sharon, thank you for, for the opportunity. And, and it's also sad, I mean, Dave and I are both 66, so this, uh, this Carrie kind of hit on it. It hits home when it's, uh, we weren't ready. Uh, but I met Dave in 2000. I had started to work at San Juan Mine and I was just gonna um, hire my direct reports. One of them was a safety director. And so Dave uh, came to interview. We'd never met each other before that. And, uh, we hadn't heard of each other. So it was when I interview, but there's a part of it. I just remember, it's one of those, you remember where you were and we're going, we're doing the tour of Farmington, which was a part of the interview process. You had to find the good spots of Farmington and show people. And uh, we were driving through Main Street down and he started talking about just how disappointed he was in a company that had, you know, first quartile as their safety goal. Just, he couldn't believe, how could anybody not have zero? I listened to that and was really too embarrassed to say, well, my prior 20 years of corporate culture was, we set out to be first quartile and we never got there. So I quickly realized there, you know, he knows things I don't know. Um, I need his help, I need him on the team. So that started 20 plus years of working together, friendship well beyond that. And uh, so he's, uh, you know, he's made a lot of difference uh, for me. And uh, I thought about what are the key things kind of I, I learned from him and you know, he had a great set skill set for the mind side. He wasn't a corporate guy that doing paper and publishing was not for him. It was about, you know, helping make the mind better, the industry better. and. You know, one of his things was that, you know, safety's a value, you know, it, it's not a priority, and that's probably not gone passe these days, but 20 years ago, that was a big difference, that, and that, you know, priorities change, values don't, and, and safety was a value, and we put that in place at the mine. And he also taught me everybody won't change overnight. If you're gonna make a change, go find those few champions that you can, you know, promote them and, and, and honor them, and it'll grow, and the culture will change, and we did that too. Um, it was all about teaching, coaching, catching people do stuff right. It wasn't about gotcha, I found you doing it wrong or be safe or else. And uh, he loved safety summits, it's something he brought from elsewhere. That was you got everybody together and by the shift and, and they got, you talked about our successes and our challenges, what we'd done and uh, he loved them. I don't know that some of the supervisors did. They all had to get up and speak. And uh, that wasn't their favorite to get up and speak to the crews, but uh, they went through it. They all survived. I think most of them thrived because of it. And then last night, I got, he, he was passionate about mine rescue and fire brigade. Something again, I wasn't fluent, particularly the, you know, uh, it wasn't about just rescue. It, was, it wasn't about an after the fact. It was the be prepared. It was the tools, the training, what we did to go. When the event happens, 
you save the day, you got 30 minutes, maybe 60 minutes, and that's when you act. And we really focused on that. And that was, again, that was something he brought to us that, uh, um, I, you know, it was, it, was, it was new and very helpful to me. So he was a mentor to me in a lot. I was blessed. Uh, he, he led the way on, that con on the safety end of things for us. I approved, I supported, I provided resources. Uh, Train till it hurts was one of the items, kind of a, one of our sayings we had. And his success didn't go unnoticed. I mean, he, he got invited a lot to regulator things. He was seen as someone, not from the mine site where, you know, less is okay. He was seen as someone with a really good, valid viewpoint. He could go, this is gonna be better, but this won't work. And people from NIOSH and MSHA actually over the years got, they would seek him out. They would go ask him, are you attending? Have you sent your comments in yet? So he was about, I think it's a thing not, not too many in the industry have earned that, uh, that recognition and respect that he had um, from the folks that, that kind of, again, the, the regulators and things for it. Um, we got some signs of success from some unlikely sources that made for some memorable events. You know, in, in January 2006, there were some uh, disasters in Aracoma Ara and um, Sago were disasters. And at San Juan, they sent some tremors through. I mean, 75% of our workers were new to mining, had never, never done it before. That was the first mining job. And the idea that fires and explosions, well, that's, that's part of it. I was like, no, that wasn't okay. We didn't sign up for that. So Dave led the charge. We put uh, uh, some refuge chambers and things in. And so it really made it better. It wasn't law. It was just uh, things that made people feel better. It made the families at home that sent their spouses and their children to work feel better about what were we doing to make it safer for them. And again, that was just, uh, for him, that was just, that's what you have to do. So um, shortly after that in, in 2006, we actually uh, got contacted um, about NPR, National Public Radio, came, wanted to do an article on these refuge stations we built. Now, again, NPR is normally not coming out to a coal mine to do a friendly article, I think, but they did in this case, they actually went underground and uh, there's a, an old NPR, all things considered, uh, about it's done from underground at San Juan with the things that was created under Dave's guidance there. Um, and there was another one, I guess, one of for both of us a career highlight. Later in 2006, we got invited, uh, and the re request came to Dave uh, to come speak at a Senate hearing. And uh, we were invited by the Democrats as a friendly witness. Now, our attorney in D.C., who's done this for 35 years, said, well, He'd never seen in 35 years the Democrats invite any operator to come and be a friendly witness at a Senate hearing. And uh, some even ask us, we're not gonna go, are you? And, uh, but the, the, you know, it's discussed with Dave and it was really clear, no, no, we're, we're going. Uh, we're gonna go talk and, and be, uh, be the first one in 35 years to go talk at a Senate hearing about the safety things we'd done. So again, Feather, and uh, sorry, I don't, didn't get this out earlier, but I have a photo, this was our I call it our Denny Crane moment. Now this is, we are, uh, it's Steve Bessinger, David, and myself. We're out on the, the veranda of this law office. So we're in DC, the Capitol building's in the back, and we've just talked to a Senate hearing. So we were, we were back on the veranda, just, you know, cigar in hand, just enjoying what we had achieved, that we'd been invited, we'd gone and talked to a Senate hearing, and, uh, you know, it was it was a good it was a good recognition for a lot of hard work is, is what it was. Yeah. And uh, but you know, one of the the, odd, the things about that though is Dave was never wanted to be the center of all that. The underground interview with NPR, I was the speaker with that. When we went to uh, to the Senate hearing, Steve was the speaker. Dave was along. Dave was a guide on it, but he didn't want to be the one that just, you know, me me in front. Um, we we did a, a video on fatalities about around continuous miners. Dave was a driver of how you put it together, what it did. It got used quite a bit within industry and other places, but. Scott Jones is the primary narrator through the core of it and some others on, on the engines. But, you know, again, you, you find on all those things, Dave's fingerprints are on them, but you actually, you know, if you didn't know better, you wouldn't know that, yeah, that's, you know, that was Dave, because he didn't seek the limelight. He just, you know, make it happen, quietly live his values was, was what he did. 
so, uh, you know, and that's one thing. This, I went through all my, I have lots of photos from work. That's the only one with Dave in it. I have one photo. He just, he just, uh, he, he didn't seek the camera. He didn't seek the recognition. But I think there's, there's, there's a lot of people who are better because of him. You see it in LinkedIn. You go out, people that work with Dave. They're off to this industrial place. They're off to this college teaching. They're off to, so they've actually done very good things. Part, you know, he was their mentor. So he mentored a lot of folks um, that went out in the mines, government agencies, manufacturers. So um, a phrase I learned back when was to help others tell great stories. And I think that's, uh, that fits Dave. It's, it's not, here's what I did. It's, I've helped others tell a really good story, and, and that's really even a higher achievement than, than hey, this is what I did. So I will, uh, I'm gonna miss him. Uh, we weren't done, we could mine coal and potash till you had to shovel your way out of the kitchen table. Uh, we could swap grandpa stories, and uh, I regret that that's, we won't do that anymore. Um, but I guess the, me, one of the highlights for the day would be, I think, when, when, when David is in heaven and he approaches, part of that initial conversation is going to include the phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. And uh, that's a good thing. Thank you. I got sent home from school one day with a shiner on my eye Fighting was against the rules and it didn't matter why When dad got home I told that story just like I'd rehearsed And then stood there on those trembling knees and waited for the worst And, and he said let me tell you a story the father's love a secret that my daddy said was just between us he said daddies don't just love their children every now and then it's a love without end amen it's a love without end amen when I became a father in the spring of 81 There was no doubt that stubborn boy Was just like my father's son And when I thought my patience Had been tested to the end I took my daddy's secret And I passed it on to him And I said let me tell you a secret About a father's love a secret that my daddy said was just between us I said daddies don't just love their children every now and then It's a love without end, amen It's a love without end, amen Last night I dreamed I died and stood outside those pearly gates when suddenly I realized there must be some mistake If they know half the things I've done they'll never let me in And then somewhere from the other side I heard these words again And they said let me tell you a secret about a father's love A secret that my daddy said was just between us you see, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. 
It's a love without end, amen. It's a love without end, amen. <laughs> I, I might need a ladder. I'm vertically challenged. That's a tough act to follow. That was a beautiful song. The Lord gave me this poem called Life Remembered. We honor those we love with choices, how we use our loves, our voices. Sorrow not to be denied, healing tears that will be cried. The path is then for you to choose. Honor life and death will lose. A life remembered, not the loss, death defeated on the cross. We can choose what we give place to. Let the love recalled embrace you. We honor those we love with choices. The heart that honors life rejoices. Tears will fall, you'll know the pain. Then every moment, choose again. The life you shared, the love you knew, it always will reside in you. Dave, you're loved, you'll be missed, and you will surely be remembered. I'm going to go first because I think they expected and I expected to not be able to maintain enough composure to where I would drag this out a little late and long. I'm going to be the worst public speaker. I'm not going to make any eye contact so I can get through it. And then we'll let our family order and writer close it out so it'll feel like it wasn't so long in the beginning. Dad didn't want a long funeral, we were told. So we. We kind of have a common, I'm not a joke, uh, something we do amongst our siblings. We always talk about top fives, and there's never only five, usually 20 or 30, but the question was posed, what are five of your top five lessons or characteristics your, your dad taught you or you learned? And really quickly, those five were 12 and 15 and so many that we decided kind of to support each other as a group because a lot of them were going to be the same. Patience kind of resounds the most for me. <laughs> a lot of stories. But integrity, charity, family first, patience and calmness are some of the biggest ones. But I can't understand if he was so patient why he was such a, in such a hurry to leave us. And I'm sure a lot of people know he wasn't always so patient. I'm sure he had to learn it too. Maybe a lot of you have experienced it or possibly heard it through a wall as he was teaching himself that, that virtue. <laughs> I know that's, that's a big one for me. He always was so calm when I was losing patience in so many things from a little boy even to the most recent week before he passed. I always, uh, always fought with the Legos, and he just told me, you got to be patient. You just got to be patient. I said, I, I only had one, and I already used it. <laughs> but he was so patient with, with kids and grandkids and everyone. He was, he was a whisperer, a, the baby whisperer, but not just the baby whisperer. He was an animal whisperer, 
loved horses and I, I can think of a couple times the horses experienced the lack of patience but he was also so compassionate that that immediately turned to grief and he taught himself some more patience he loved his garden he loved the work in the yard he loved to be with the family he was so patient and so hands-on with all of us his little kids we were kind of his partners he from when I was so little he would always take me out to coffee with him and I don't know maybe I was kind of cute too because I always got extra whipped cream on my hot chocolate at the, at the safari I think I got those looks from him uh, we spent so much time doing so many things as a family together and I just can't imagine the patience he had with so many little kids in a car making him play Chicago on repeat over and over before CDs we had to rewind the tape to get it back to the same song and listen to that same one over and over he would take me hunting and constantly had activities to keep us entertained and just expressed such such patience and I don't usually say a number one thing but patience is the number one thing that I, that I learned from, from my dad and I'm gonna miss him so much I'm Corey. I'm the, I'm the baby. <laughs> Just still can't, can't believe we're here. Everyone, everyone thought that he was going to live to be in his 90s just like his dad. <clears throat> just have so many good memories of growing up here in Redmond and being in Price and then New Mexico and everywhere, everywhere we went, everybody, in the mining industry and just in the community just respected him so much. He's a, just a, I don't know how I did it, because I, I still keep, I've had like 38 different jobs, I can't feel, <laughs> but I finally think I'm where I'm going to be happy, but he, whatever he did, he worked so hard, and he wanted to be the best at whatever he was doing, not to show off for anything, but he just wanted to be quietly successful. Probably the best way I could say it. But I, when this happened, so many people would <clears throat> reach out to me and tell me <laughs> my dad hated when I'd blow my nose. <laughs> I'd get so embarrassed if we were out in the anywhere outside if we were at the especially if it was a restaurant or if we were around people that meant a lot to him i think he'd hate it when my uncle carrie would do it too <laughs> we we do a lot of the same things that he didn't really care for but when this happened so many people hundreds of people have reached out to me just saying sorry and we're there for you and people would tell me stories that him and my mom just helping people and never showing off doing it for years and years people that I went to high school with and tell me when they'd help them when they were struggling or down or trying to find their way but I never knew this I just hope that I can be someone like that I can help people and but he 
just like everybody said, he he loved his family so much, and I know he was proud of all of us. And he would I just the night before it happened, hours before it happened, I had just got home. I had an interview with the Smiths and got hired on the spot. And I was so happy to tell him, and they were video chatting with my kids. And just both of both of my parents had big smiles on their face, and I could tell they were proud of me. He was a good mentor. He he taught me so many things, and just count countless things. And thinking about now all these road trips that we had to replay music or. We would be playing the alphabet game, and you pick out the letters of the alphabet on the signs that you passed, and we'd do that for hours and hours, going to family reunions, just talking to a couple of cousins, saying how we were looking at the pictures and how much how much we did as a family when we were younger. I mean, we were doing together at the church, together at the park, together out in nature somewhere, and Dad, Dad loved nature. He liked the sunsets, he liked sunrises, animals, any any kind of animal. And he could just make them like, roll over and give them their belly. It was the craziest thing. But yeah, he... I'd be a bad example of this, but he said if you took a job, you committed to it, and you did your best, and you didn't quit. And I've done it couple of those things a couple of times so but he all the people that I met walking through and I'd hear their names as you would come in and show your respect for my father he uh, I never I didn't meet everybody but I recognized names and he always talked the people that he would talk so highly about you knew that they meant something to him and, just happy that he was who he was. We're gonna we're gonna miss him a lot. I'm Crystal. Um, I'm Dave's other daughter. <laughs> And when I think about dad and his love for his children, he does remind me of a horse. A strong, quiet, and steady. Some of my fondest memories of my childhood in Redmond are our summer days riding horses together. He uh, put me in 4-H once when I was a little girl, and we had ridden horses, you know, forever, but I'd never been in 4-H, and we went to the arena, and I was walking that horse and walking that horse, and he just kept saying, give it her a little kick, give her a little kick. And that horse took off and started to gallop, and I was scared to death. I grabbed the horn, and I looked at him for comfort, and his arms were straight up in the air smiling and he said hang on tight <laughs> and when I looked at him and he was smiling so big at me I I knew I was gonna be okay and I grabbed the reins and I galloped through that arena a few times and he picked me up off the horse and spun me around and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world I knew he was proud and he was always proud of all of us. I loved gardening with him and eating buckets of peas on the front porch. I think I ate peas until I threw up one night. I mean, we ate so many peas from his garden when we were kids. Shucking the corn for dinner and freezing it for the winter. He had a way of just being with us that made us feel so loved 
safe and secure. And as you all know, he listened far more than he spoke. And when he did have something to say, it was always genuine and helpful and never critical or judgmental. You know, when I think about Dad and I's relationship, I try to <laughs> explain it to people. It can sound so complex, but it's really quite simple. You know, he loved us all simply and wholly, effortlessly and unconditionally. And I'm grateful that he loved me because I know he didn't have to. I think they left this up here for me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, most of you know my dad was a great public speaker, and I am not one, so I am calling on him <laughs> to be here with me. Um, one of the things I've loved watching of him in recent years is his love of learning. He was always an avid reader his whole, on my whole life, but he learned how to do anything you could want to do on YouTube. Um, our washer broke and we were ready to throw it out and get a new one and he hauled it into the garage and got out YouTube. He watched YouTube for a couple of days. I really do think I need this. <laughs> um, and worked with Jared in the garage to fix our washer. He loved learning to cook. He was always a gardener but became an incredible gardener. Sharon says that the smaller the yard got or the smaller the household got, the bigger the garden got. <laughs> Um, but it was very much about self-improvement, both personally and professionally. And he was a mentor to me professionally, for sure. He was a, as we've heard from so many people, he was a, a servant leader. And he cared about his people. Um, he was funny. <laughs> he was so quiet sometimes, I think people don't realize how funny he was, but he loved to hide and scare people, and he loved to scare Sharon. We've heard stories from the St. Pierre's about, you know, him scaring him on Halloween. Um, Crystal remembered him putting out Valentine's, kicking Valentine's on the door, and going out to grab him, and he'd attached them to fishing line, pulling him away, and he got the biggest kick out of that. Um, after his seizure, so we had a seizure in October, and it was a long road of tests and exams and waiting to see what was going on. And he, you know, he was got got a kick out of calling us to tell us that a medical professional had confirmed it, confirmed it, and he did in fact have a brain. Um, he also he he was so healthy and he was so concerned with being healthy and preventing illness and he did all the things you're supposed to do all the checkups and all the exams and eating healthy and he had started intermittent fasting um he was very rigid about getting his colonoscopy when it was due which he had just had and he also wanted to call and let us know that he was still a perfect asshole <laughs> Um, the most treasured mem memory I will keep with me and my dad is the chance to go to the Kentucky Derby. He wanted to go his whole life. And when he called to ask Jared and I if I would go, Jared said, how much? <laughs> but I didn't hesitate for a minute. I knew I, I wanted to go, but I wanted to watch my dad go. And being there with him was the, the most special week and the most special memories. Um, I've never seen that man have a moment of so much pure joy other than with his kids and his grandkids. He loved all of you so much and his siblings and taught us the importance of family. 
the importance of staying close to your aunts and uncles and grandparents and, and families, everything. Um, these guys have talked about it, but the, the one thing that always stands to me is kind of my number one word is presence. If he was with you, he was with you. He heard you. He, you know, with the little kids, he was down on the floor playing. There were no distractions. He was always there. And I know that he will continue to be with us. And he loved you, Sharon, more than anything. And we love you, too. you were balancing on that. <laughs> um, thank you for letting me be part of this. Talked to Sharon the other night, or the other day, introduced myself and first, about the second thing that came out of her mouth is uh, you're not from Redmond are you <laughs> no so I told her how I got here so uh, but anyway last night when the uh, viewing was going on I spent the majority of the time watching that video looking at the displays and getting impressions about Dave who I've, I don't know and uh, a lot of these uh, stories confirmed some of my impressions. Notice that uh, from one of the pictures in the video that he was a Boy Scout. Notice that he was dressed white for his baptism and also one of his grandkids, I believe, was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints first impression I got was Dave was a family man. Uh, as I watched that uh, video over and over and over, I would say he, he of all of those video, uh, pictures, there were very few of just him. It was him and a horse, him and a dog, him and his kids, it looked like weddings, some of the girls, uh, grandkids galore. And uh, so I think I kind of figured out Dave. He's a lot like me. I'm a couple of years older than him. I did enjoy those early pictures because it reminded me of my early pictures with the little bow tie. Uh, Notice that he, there were several pictures of birthday parties, trips, particularly Yellowstone, camping, baseball, swimming, hunting, animals, and family gatherings. Seems to me that Dave did a great job in supporting his family. I've always believed and still do believe that my most important asset is my free time. And I think that was one of Dave's, and he spent that with his family and friends. And I think these were some of his uh, important priorities. I did pick up from some of the conversation here that he loved animals. Just an impression I had from what I watched yesterday. I saw Dave patting and rubbing gently a horse. I'm assuming it was his. Uh, another one, and I, and I basically said he treated his animals as another part of his family. Enjoyed hugging and laying next to his dog. And a couple of phrases that I read that reminded me of this. You can usually tell that a man is good if he has a dog who loves him. I think dogs are the most 
amazing creatures they give unconditional love for me they are the sole model of being alive and I would think when I read this that this was probably true of Dave my fashion philosophy is if you're not covered in dog hair your life is empty and one that impression I received was Dave was a hard worker uh, I wasn't raised on a farm I didn't work on a farm I worked some construction back in the college days but I think Dave as indicated was a very methodical hard-working individual I was going to summarize the plan of salvation, but we're running short, and I think it's already being addressed. We all know that we came here. Uh, we were going to be uh, faced with trials and uh, celebration, and, it, uh, and that, that uh, this life would end by another step of going back and uh, living with our Heavenly Father. I appreciate being part of this uh, service and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We will now have a, I was, I know, I know Tammy really well. I said, boy, I'm glad I'm talking before Tammy because I'm going to be teary eyed, but I think the, the four of you guys did a good job. Uh, Tammy will sing Jealous of the Angels, Tammy ha hails Okerlund. And the benediction will be by Christine Laws. Just want to note that the uh, grave dedication will be done by Ed Christiansen, a brother-in-law. have to say goodbye to you so fast and I'm so numb I can't feel anymore I'm praying you'd come walking through that door and tell me that I was only dreaming you're not really gone as long as I believe There will be another angel around the throne tonight Your love lives inside of me and I will hold it tight It's not my place to question, only God knows why I'm jealous of the angels around the throne tonight You always made my troubles seem so small And you were always there to catch me when I'd fall and in a world where heroes come and go well, God just took the only one I know And so I'll hold you as close as I can Longing for the day 
when I'll see your face again. But until then, God must need another angel around the throne tonight. Your love's inside of me, and I will hold it tight. It's not my place to question, only God knows why. I'm jealous of the angels around the throne tonight. Singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm just jealous of the angels around the throne tonight. Our dear, kind, gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, we're thankful for this beautiful service in honor of shared about him and the wonderful person that he was. Father, we ask thee at this time to please bless Sharon and Becky, Michael, Crystal and Corey and their families. Again, we ask thee to put my arm around them and give them comfort and peace. We ask thee also, Father in heaven, to please it. take us to the cemetery in safety and then on to our homes where we can be with our loved ones. We ask thee to please. Watch over Dave for us. Say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen.
Schlitten hauen wird. right in there and announce the grave dedication. Get as close as you can. All right, I'm going to turn the time over to Ed Christensen, who will do the dedication of the grave. Just as close as you can. Our dear Heavenly Father, by the authority of the Melchizedek Priesthood, I dedicate and consecrate this burial spot as the, rest, as the resting place for the body of David Charles Hales. And this will be a hallowed and protected place until his resurrection. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will uh, give comfort to the family at this time and that they will be comfort in their knowledge of Christ's atonement for us. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, this concludes the services. Of, you're all invited back to the ward house for lunch. Thank you. at the church. We should do it with the flowers in the casket, you know? Okay. No, not really. I mean, I'm not, I'm not slipping, but... Yeah, that's a, a classic car right there. Thank you. Uh